Good evening. Um, my name is Linda Vita. I'm the director of the Water Resources Center Archives, and we're the main sponsor for this event. This is the last uh, lecture of the season, but we do have the spring schedule set, and I'd like to tell you what that will be. February 9th, we're going to have Juliet Christian Smith from the Pacific Institute and Dr. David Zoldowski from the, Cal the Center for Irrigation Technology, and they're going to talk about water conservation in agriculture. March 9th, uh, Brian Kluwer, who's a fluvial geomorphologist at NOAA. April 13th, Meg Caldwell. Um, she was executive director of the Center for Ocean Studies, and she's also a professor at Stanford. And May 4th, Peter McCarrigan, who is part of the Environmental Restoration Division at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and he's going to talk about groundwater pollution. So really is a great series, great lineup. And um, as it's the last uh, lecture of the fall, I also want to thank our financial sponsors that make this series possible. Um, I have to read it, so I don't make sure not to leave anyone out. The um, UC Berkeley California Center for Environmental Law and Policy, the Beatrix Farron Fund of the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning, the Executive Vice Chancellor of the campus, and also the Berkeley Water Center, who so graciously uh, sponsored the receptions before each lecture, and I think those are a really a great hit. The Earth Sciences Division of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, the Groundwater Resources Association of California, and the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. So I want to thank them, and um, thank you all for for coming, and I'd like to introduce Professor Matt Kondolf, who will introduce the speaker for the evening. Thanks, Linda. Um, so that I don't forget, those of you who are in the colloquium seminar, um, Tim is uh, delayed a bit, so um, we definitely want to meet right after the lecture, fill out the forms, and pass in your papers. Okay. So uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Hervé Piaget, um, who is a director of research with the French National Scientific Laboratory. Um, some of you may know there's a very good network of scientific laboratories around France. Uh, he's been working in Lyon in a unit that's called uh, Mixed Research, uh, Environment, Society, and City. And uh, his work is that really the application of hydrology, geomorphology, uh, and uh, other tools to uh, solving problems in uh, fluvial geomorphology and river management. Um, I began uh, working with Hervé in 1996. It was uh, kind of a very lucky break for me. I had a sabbatical in France, and um, I was uh, fortunate enough to be teamed up with Hervé, and uh, he's a great person to work with, lots of ideas, and a uh, great sense of humor, too. So good times in the field. Hervé has been a leader in uh, uh, several areas in fluvial geomorphology. Uh, he's a pioneer in many tools in the field, and uh, he and I have edited a book on tools in fluvial geomorphology. He's um, worked a great deal on dead wood in channels. Doesn't that sound exciting? So uh, uh, large woody debris, as it's often called, uh, but we don't like to use the word debris, so we say large wood. Uh, but its role in channels and how it's uh, recruited and moved through river systems. A lot of work done on this in the Pacific Northwest, but uh, not so much in other parts of the world, and Hervé has really uh, triggered a, uh, led a lot of studies in uh, Europe and, and elsewhere. Um, he's also been very active in studying dead arms. Sound exciting? <laughs> These are former channels of rivers, oxbow lakes and the like, which uh, provides some of the greatest habitat diversity on the floodplain of, of rivers. And um, uh, everybody and I took some tours around California, and uh, uh, he was very excited to see the Sacramento because it's still a real river. And, uh, and so um, he has been uh, spearheading uh, some very interesting work on the side channels of the Sacramento River system. 
Uh, in the course of that, he's also done some very interesting work on how the River Channel has evolved since Shasta Dam, some things that uh, hadn't really been noticed by anyone else before because they hadn't spent so much time on the air photos, uh, a lot of which we digitized uh, thanks to the collection of Steve Greco at UC Davis. And I'm going to shut up and turn it over to Hervé. Thanks so much for coming. <coughs> Okay, good, uh, good evening, everybody. So I would like to thank uh, uh, my, my friend, uh, Matt Condolf. He, he did a very uh, impressive introduction, so I am stressed now. And uh, <laughs> my English is not as fluent as his English. So uh, you'll, you'll get a French accent, but perhaps you will not understand everything. So um, I will not speak about uh, uh, Deadwood today but about uh, shifting uh, rivers. And uh, as uh, you know, the Sacramento uh, upstream from Calusa is one of uh, very active rivers. And also in France, we have uh, this kind of rivers where erosion is a very uh, uh, active uh, uh, process. Uh, and uh, so the question is, how can we manage uh, bank erosion in such system where we have to find a sort of balance uh, between uh, what we gain with erosion, but also what we, what we lost. And uh, so here, uh, the talk is titled uh, The Espace de Liberté. And uh, so Matt uh, uh, li liked to speak French, uh, as I like to speak English. So he, 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 uh, he uh, improved my, uh, my title, who was totally in English. So Espace de Liberté, I have to translate it. Uh, means uh, the space of liberty. Uh, and uh, you will see that uh, the problem of erosion can be treated at a technical level, but it, it must be also treated at a political level. And this is why we speak about espace de liberté, and we'll go come back to this, uh, to this idea. We, spe we speak also about space of mobility, which is more technical to explain what we are speaking here. And uh, the question is truly to manage uh, 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 the process on a river who are changing uh, actively. And so uh, uh, I, I give my talk with uh, Adrien Halbert, who is uh, an engineer who is finishing his PhD in the lab and who did a lot about the implementation and the development of this idea of space of liberty and the development in a practical point of view. So I, I am here to explain all the process uh, because we move from uh, scientific questioning to, to more uh, practical issues. And a part of what I will explain here is now pass uh, into the uh, French le legislation. And uh, we are uh, in the state of the, of the implementation of this, uh, of this concept. OK, so uh, when I speak about uh, uh, bank erosion, you have an example here on a, a river of the Rhone network. I will introduce the area where I work. But just to show you, uh, I will speak about bank erosion and the problem of management. And you can see that when the river erodes its banks, its bank, then we can have trouble in such environment because we have a lot of stakes. And most of the time, when we are in, th in such condition, we have to protect the bank. So another example on the braided rivers, uh, it's another tributary of, of the Rhone River in France. So you see some agricultural land. And you, again, you see this bank erosion. And you can understand there is this tax and, uh, stacks and needs to, to, to protect this bank again. And uh, on this picture, this is a third river of the Rhone catchment. This is the A River. And it looks uh, like a small Sacramento. Uh, so you, can, you, you have here some uh, GIS layer of the position of the channel from 2000 back to 1945. So this gives you an idea of the movement of the channel within the floodplain. And uh, if you look at the, the, the movement here, you, you may uh, calculate a, a movement of uh, se 7 to 10 meters a year. So just to give you an idea of the movement, which can be quite quick. I mean, uh, at, uh, at the scale of uh, human life, 
uh, you, you can see the, the change in the landscapes, and you can understand why this process uh, can, pr can, can have some uh, problems associated with uh, the land use management of this environment. So uh, the idea of the space of mobility is not completely new. It, Im it emerged in, the, in different countries uh, during the 90s. And the first publication is the one of Palmer in uh, 1976, where he, he, he spoke about the streamway, so a sort of a, a corridor where the river could move. And we see di different uh, examples of uh, this. Uh, so in France, it appeared in uh, 1990 during uh, uh, what we call the Assise Nationale de l'eau. So it was a, a national meeting where people, scientists, and, and uh, people working in application, practitioners, uh, spoke to the, together to improve uh, uh, the water management. And so during this uh, meeting, the idea of uh, space of mobility emerged, and some guideline has been published in 1998, and new ones in 1999 and 2001 uh, to, uh, to apply this kind of concepts. And you know, it, uh, it occurred in the 90s in France, and it occurred elsewhere. Uh, Thorne and his colleagues spoke about repayant corridors. In Italy, we have also examples of such uh, ideas. And also in the US, with the Federal Interagency Stream Restoration Working Group, who spoke about stream corridor and some uh, guidelines and such as the idea has been developed by, by colleagues on the Russian, uh, Russian River in, in California. And also we have some example of guideline in Washington State in 2003. So we published a paper in, in uh, river research and application with colleagues from Italy, uh, New Zealand, and, uh, uh, and the UK about what, what we call the erodible uh, corridor concept, uh, and the question of zoning, uh, planning, uh, land use zoning in order to uh, manage uh, the erosion problem and to avoid uh, bank protection. So uh, the space of freedom has been defined uh, as a definition is in a master plan of the Rhone Mediterranean Corsica Basin in 1997. So in, in France, we have a, 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 a very important law published in uh, 1992. This is a water law. And we have to manage a uh, river and what we call water bodies. It can be lakes, groundwater, stream, rivers, but also uh, estuaries and uh, uh, coastal uh, portion. Uh, uh, so we, uh, a master plan has been defined in 1997 to plan the water. So you have, you have Europe here. So you have France in Europe. And you have the district, the, the, uh, hydro, the basin I spoke here. This is a basin where all the, the water is going down to the Mediterranean River, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. So it's uh, the eastern part of France, mainly the Rhone catchment. It's uh, roughly uh, uh, 98,000 kilometers square, just to give you an idea of the size of this area, and also the coastal streams of Provence and uh, Languedoc-Roussillon. So all this, uh, uh, so we get a master plan of this area in 1997. And because uh, uh, stopping bank protection policy was quite new and not well accepted uh, by uh, uh, elected peoples or uh, owners or other uh, water actors, then they decided to uh, uh, publish some guidelines to explain why we are promoting such policy. And they also uh, give uh, provided a definition of what is a space of freedom. So this is a floodplain in which the active channel can naturally move in order to maintain a coarse sediment supply and optimal uh, terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem functioning. 
Okay, so this is a guideline which has been published in 98, and you see, you see how to determine the space of freedom for rivers. This is what it is uh, written in French. And so some uh, uh, document like this has been also distributed. You know the space of liberty for rivers. You can see what kind of river we refer here, and you have an idea that in California you can find such kind of river in Northern California, or also Oregon or Washington states, uh, Washington state. And this is a principle of uh, equilibrium management, or we would say sustainable management uh, of uh, mobile shifting rivers, and uh, how to design, how to determine this, uh, this corridor. So this is just to explain people uh, what, to, what, what we could do for this kind of river. And after this uh, uh, document, uh, uh, you have some example of uh, uh, French law, where uh, such as this uh, decret, so this is a, a, a juridical uh, a, a text, uh, which is issued by the French uh, Ministry of Environment. And uh, it concerns the mining sites, where, where when you want to open a query, when you want to extract gravel in the floodplain, then uh, it has been forbidden in 1994. You cannot dig, remove gravel from the channel, but you can continue to remove gravel within the floodplain. But if your river is moving, and if you, be, if you create a query within the floodplain, then you, you may counteract with a natural process of the river. And just to uh, avoid such a situation, uh, then uh, the text here uh, indicate uh, that uh, mining sites would no longer be permitted in the space of mobility of rivers. And then we have to define what is the space of mobility just to demonstrate that the mining we will open is not located with a, mining, with a, a mobility corridor. And so the space must be mapped on a channel length of at least five kilometers in the vicinity of the mining site concerned. Another example of the law of February 2002, who modifies the rules about bank protection uh, structures. And uh, it is indicated that the bank protections must not reduce significantly the space of mobility of the channel and the band being defined on the basis of an historical analysis of channel mobility. So just to give you an idea of uh, uh, this kind of uh, concept uh, has now a uh, clear uh, effect in, in the legal aspects and the land use management of our river. And here you have a last uh, information about a law of July 2003, on uh, natural and technological risks. And here it is said that uh, we, have, uh, we can have some servitude uh, of, uh, pu for public needs which can be established along rivers. So you, we can go in private land uh, to, do, uh, uh, different, uh, to take different measures. And this is usually done for flooding purposes. But now it also it has been expanded to the question of the space of mobility like you can see here, for flood management, but also for creating or restoring the space of mobility. So just to, to see, uh, to link uh, my talk with some practical issues and legal consequences. So the outline is, uh, why do we promote such strategy, leave uh, a river living by itself, uh, where we can get some uh, contour uh, productive effects in terms of economical purposes, for example. And how do we proceed? If we don't want to protect, we cannot say, no, we, we don't fund, we forbid any protections because we have tax. So we have to plan and decide what we can do, where and why. Okay, so this is uh, the basin I, I refer previously. So here is just an indication. Uh, so you have all the network. J just to give you an idea, the network here is 45,000 kilometers of uh, rivers. 
And uh, so you have the network here. And this gives you an idea of the channel slope in meter per kilometer. So you can see, except in this area, that uh, all this uh, basin is a, a alpine mountain basin. So you have some uh, high energy river. And uh, this, so this is what we call the Western Alps and the White Mount, so the, the peak of the, uh, uh, the, peak of the, uh, uh, of the Alps is uh, uh, located uh, uh, somewhere here, so at the border with, with Italy. So you have a lot of uh, braided rivers, for example, wandering rivers or shifting, uh, free meandering rivers. And uh, uh, the Rhone is collecting all the tributary coming from the Alps, and this mountain area, which is called the Massif Central, and uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, an alpine river almost uh, 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 at, at the confluence, uh, 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 at the mouth, at the delta uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. You don't have a lowland ridge, in fact, because uh, the, the, the steep slope occur all along this main channel, and gravel enter in this uh, uh, system all along its path, and which is uh, unusual is the lowland part is located in the upstream part of the basin. OK. So just to uh, give you a, a good idea of the, of the catchment, and this is just uh, some points of rivers. Uh, so we have studied for planning purposes all the network you have here, and I will introduce this at the end of my talk. And uh, we have uh, specifically, specifically studied some of the rivers which appear here on the map. So just to give you an idea of the pattern we can get, I spoke about braided river. You have uh, one here, wandering river, or uh, you know uh, some uh, uh, meandering river, so shifting, actively moving. You have here an overlay of uh, uh, two situations, one roughly in the 70s, the red one, and one actually. So it gives you an idea of how this kind of rivers can move uh, uh, through time at a, a, decadal, uh, a decadal scale. And you have also some meandering river in the northern part, lowland streams, where the movement is much slower uh, than the other uh, ridge located there, 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 or there. OK, so why do we promote such strategy? The, the main issue is the problem of sediment recharge. And uh, we want to uh, preserve erosion because we are uh, in a context where mining activity, damming, embankment has uh, uh, strongly limited the sediment entrance. And so you have sediment starvation and, sediment and, and channel incision on a large length of the network. And this has uh, uh, provoked a lot of uh, uh, problems in terms of uh, uh, stability of infrastructures. So the main issue is not an ecological issue. It's truly uh, uh, an economical and uh, 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 infrastructure issue. How can we protect some infrastructures which has been built uh, 50 years ago and sometimes two centuries ago where the water level was much higher than the one we have now? And we get some channel incision of several metros, and we have maximum of 12 to uh, uh, 14, uh, one, 14 metros of channel degradation over uh, a decade. So the channel is more than 10 metros lower than it was 10 years before. So just to give you an idea of what kind of change we can observe. And this explains why we try to find uh, and to preserve all the source of sediment who may be used to slow down this kind of process. So uh, here you have a, a river, the Do River, where we did some mining. And uh, so we have some uh, satellite image from Spot in uh, 1986. And you can see the query into this river. So just to give you an idea of uh, what I call a mining uh, site within the channel, it explains why it has been forbidden in 1994. And uh, uh, so it has been forbidden here. 
at the end of the 90s. And uh, you can see here uh, a decade later that the query you have here has been completely filled by coarse sediment. But you can see this one is not yet filled. So it means that the, the channel here is still impacted by the interruption of the gravel. And uh, if you compare this picture, this image, and this image, you see here a sort of delta moving into the, uh, into the uh, uh, mining lake you have here. And you see this gravel is mainly coming from here. You see the bars you had here? Here you have no more bars. So this is a good indication of the channel degradation which occur here because of uh, uh, regressive erosion. So this gives you an idea of the impact of such activity at the local site where the, many, the, the query occurred, but with clear consequences upstream and downstream. And it occurred for many years and decades after the activity stopped. And so uh, just to give you an idea, to protect some bridge like this one built at the end of the 19th century, we have to build some weirs like that. And we have many examples where this uh, weir has been undermined uh, again because of channel incision. And sometimes we have a weir protecting uh, the first weir. So we enter in a sort of a vicious cycle uh, and where we, we must build protection to, to protect the previous protection, build to protect the previous infrastructure. So uh, other example of uh, bridge uh, uh, pile undermining, or you can see here some other bridge where we built some weir uh, on different, different kind of context. And here you have a, a dike which has been also undermined. So when, when uh, some of the practitioners said, don't worry about uh, channel incision because the bed will be uh, uh, deeper, and so we will be able to put more water during a flood, and we will have less flooding problems. The problem with this kind of river, where you have a lot of embankment built uh, several decades ago, is uh, you, you can get some uh, 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 embankment breakage. So uh, you are not preserved from flooding, and if you have such incision, then you have to spend a lot of money actually to uh, restore the, the dike so that the urbanized area can be protected from flooding. So you, you, you can imagine what kind of uh, uh, practical issue uh, we are faced to. So another example is the uh, lower uh, valley. So you have an alluvial ridge located there, downstream from a chain of dams you have here. And this dam has been built in the 60s, and you have no more gravel passing through it. And so this uh, shifting river is actually reacting to this uh, uh, damming. And we have a process uh, uh, roughly similar to the Sacramento as well. So what we did is uh, uh, we did a survey of the gravel on the bars you have here, and we, we use uh, uh, digital techniques to determine uh, the D50, uh, the grain size, the median grain size of, of the bars. And so what we can see, here we are upstream and we go downstream. And you can see in this part that uh, the bars are significantly coarser than the bars you can get downstream. And we have a, a very significant paving effects associated with the starvation due to the dam. And here you have some, uh, a, a, a clear difference uh, in this ridge here, which is not yet affected uh, by sediment starvation, where you have uh, an active shifting, where you have new bars creation with a very nice uh, repiant forest. And this ridge, which is already affected, incised, and more stable than it was before. And you see uh, the problem of undermining of infrastructure. And you can see also uh, the problem of uh, habitats. Here we are in the section which is affected by the starvation. 
you see that the gravel is no more moved, is coarser, and the particles are joined to each other. They cannot move, and uh, you have no place for spawning areas and for fish purposes. And here you are in the downstream part, not yet affected by the dam, where you have a mobile gravel barge. So just to give you a clear idea of the difference you can get between the two reaches. So the idea of uh, preserving uh, bank erosion is associated with also the idea of introducing sediment. And uh, for people, they like fish. Sometimes they like riparian trees. But they don't care about gravel. So uh, we have to explain in a pedagogical way that uh, we must like gravel because uh, uh, it's, uh, if we have gravel, then we can get living rivers and living community. And just to give you the kind of, uh, if you have a nice salmon to explain a policy, uh, it's, uh, you have an emblematic species, then you can explain easily to owners why you, you are doing this and this. Here you have to explain that uh, there is some property and you don't want to protect them. So you have uh, many rotten tomatoes waiting for you at the beginning of the meeting. <laughs> and then uh, you have to explain that. So uh, this is a kind of picture. This is the Air River. So the river with pre precious uh, cobbles. So uh, it's only limestone. And uh, so there is also rolling cobbles, so just so some charts and indica indication to explain to owners, practitioners, and, uh, and people living into the basin why we are doing that. So not protect the bank, but also reintroducing some gravel. So I will not speak about that, but just to explain you that we have some experience where we are introducing sediment like that within the Air River downstream from the dam. So the second question, sediment recharge, the second question is uh, we understood that uh, uh, the traditional engineering uh, bank protections can have some limits. I mean, uh, we, we are enough strong to put a good protection so that the river cannot move. The problem is uh, a problem of uh, cost efficiency and stakes. And uh, so one of the thing is when the stakes is not too high and when the erosion occur everywhere, then the local community want to uh, develop bank protection everywhere, but with a, a small amount of money. And so they are going to promote some bank protection where, which, which are not as efficient as they should be. And so uh, the protection will not stay for a long time. And uh, you have an example here on the Air River where you, uh, bank protection has been built in the 1990. And uh, uh, one year after it has been built, it has been strongly uh, eroded, destroyed uh, by the river. The river uh, just uh, in this band, we are in a concave band, uh, degrade after the the construction of the riprap protection of one mattress, and a part of the bank protection slides into the river. So five years after the protection construction, then the, the river manager paid for another study to see what we should do for this band. And one of the ideas is to try to help the river to move to another way. And just to give you uh, this uh, example, because it, ha it has been, in France, very important for, for practitioners to understand why we try to promote other policy for this kind of river moving very actively. And so this is a, another example on the Galore River. So you have here a riprap protection, and you can see that it has been strongly destructed by the flood. And we have an example where you can see cobbles uh, build big boulders in the middle of the river, and the river is continuing to move. And so just uh, to, to show you that it's a sort of vicious cycle, as I explained previously, this is a year. And here, this is uh, the money which has been spent 
1993 by the local community on these two rivers to protect the banks. And so this is a cumulated curve. And when we did the study in 1993 here, it's uh, uh, 10 million of francs, which was uh, uh, quite uh, high, 1.5 uh, million of uh, dollar, uh, roughly. I don't use uh, franc anymore now. We use euro. But if I remember well, uh, 1, 1 million, 1.5 million of dollars, which is quite high for a, a rural community uh, working on a small catchment. And uh, so uh, when, when we survey the bank protection, we have seen that uh, uh, half of the protection had been destabilized. So it means only half of the work was still effective to protect the bank. OK, so we, we did uh, uh, on a few rivers a sort of cost-benefit analysis to try to see, to compare what is the cost of protection if we protect in a proper way all the banks which are eroded, and also the benefit, the benefit we can get if we don't protect the bank. So we, 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 we integrated the value of the eroded fields, but also the values of the agriculture uh, productions over uh, a decade uh, also. Uh, and we did not consider all the benefits which are not integrated in the monetary, mo monetary system. I speak about the ecological benefit has been not considered. But what, just if you compare cost of the land and production versus, uh, so if you don't protect, you are going to lose something. And uh, compare this with the cost of protection. Most of the time, uh, the balance uh, is uh, completely uh, uh, in, is in the favor of the unprotection un policy on this kind of river. OK. Uh, the, so the third argument is the ecological role of bank protection. So in the 90s, we say, the uh, mineral engineering protections are, are not uh, ecologically good. So we have to promote other bank protection. So we move to bioengineering techniques on shifting rivers. And so we had to explain, OK, you have an ecological improvement moving from a mineral infrastructure to a bioengineering one. You have an example here. But in any case, you stop the bank erosion process. And uh, so in this kind of system, you stop uh, the engine who is uh, uh, promoting, developing uh, the ecological diversity you have on this kind of rivers. And uh, because here, you know that uh, all this forest and the stage, the age of this forest, the habitat conditions you have are very different from roughly dry in the upper part of a point bar to more uh, wet in the downstream part. You have an example here. Uh, so you have different habitat condition and different vegetation conditions. So the diversity of the riparian vegetation is completely linked with the bank erosion. And also, uh, this bank erosion uh, process is creating what we call a cutoff, a shoot cutoff or neck cutoff. Uh, we'll speak about that during the Q&A step. I learned this uh, previously. Uh, um, one hour ago, so I, I use the term. Uh, I practice my English. Uh, so so we, we have a cutoff here. And you have other uh, ecological habitat, which are associated with the former channel and the oxbows uh, you have here. So here you have a double uh, uh, cutoff. And you see also uh, many kind of aquatic habitat which are created in this kind of environment. So here you have a map, a, 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 a vegetation map of the uh, river. And so we looked at the spatial variability of the uh, riparian landscape in this uh, uh, area. So we use a Shannon index. We use also the, uh, uh, the number of different habitats and the proportion of uh, pioneer habitats within uh, the corridor. And we get such uh, statistics where you have here in red uh, 
Here you have different kind of reaches from upstream to downstream. So reach one to reach 10 located there. So this is the, the area uh, one and two which are affected by the dam. And here you have the area which are still shifting. And this gives you an idea of the mosaic diversity. You know that it's significantly much higher here than it is upstream. Again, this indicator of the number of habitats is higher in this area, and also the proportion of the pioneer habitats. So this just gives you an idea of how the movement of the channel can provide additional value in terms of uh, ecological landscapes. And so this kind of thing uh, you have also on the Sacramento uh, between Colutha and uh, Red Bluff, and we have the, uh, the chance uh, to work here with uh, Matt Condolf and uh, Steve Greco, which is uh, also here in the room. And we worked with uh, uh, aerial photos to see what's going on. So here you have a, a graph which has been prepared by, uh, by Steve, where we can see here you have the time, and here you have the land production rate. So you can see that uh, the bank erosion, the floodplain re re uh, renewal, was quite high at the end of the 19th century and then moved down. You have an exception here because of a big flood before the construction of the Shasta Dam and reduced uh, uh, during the, the, the most recent period. And this uh, is strongly associated with uh, another history, which is uh, the evolution of the floodplain lake surface area so you can see here again the time, and you have here the area of the floodplain lakes, which are associated with the Oxbows. And you can see that uh, at the end of the 19th century, we had large Oxbows, which were created in this environment. And you see that uh, until the middle of the uh, 20th century, the second part of the 20th century, we have uh, 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 former channel, which are smaller and smaller. And one of the reasons is the development of the different riprap protection, the stability of the river, which are pushing her, her, or in French it's, uh, we use the feminine, or who are, which are pushing it uh, into a smaller, a narrower corridor. So, uh, Another uh, example, here, here you have the sedimentation rate. And uh, let's see, the sedimentation rate in centi cent uh, centimeter per year. And here you have the, the year since cutoff. And you can see that uh, you have different type. So here are the oxbows, and these are straighter channels. But if we are no more oxbows which are created now, it means that a part of the ecological uh, diversity you have on this river will be progressively lost in, in the future. I mean, the diversity is becoming less and less right now. And we are looking just now at the effect of the Shasta Dam, because the, the, the reach is actually reacting to the dam, which is located farther upstream. So you have a check. Oh. You, you have a changing river. So let's see. OK. Uh, the, the fourth point is a question of peak flow lowering. Uh, and here I put a, a question mark. I mean, one of the, um, if you have a lower floodplain, and if bank erosion regenerate uh, floodplain at a lower level, then you can get a floodplain who can store uh, more water. And for people who are knowing uh, the Sacramento River, you know that the peak flow is uh, arriving at Colusa uh, later and at a lower level than the one we can observe in, in Red Bluff or Hamilton. And then it means that uh, the floodplain is trapping the water. And if the floodplain is rougher, with a forest, it can trap also reduce the velocity of the water. And if the floodplain 
is at a lower level. This is an added value to store more water. And so this is one of issue. If we maintain bank erosion, it is possible within different corridors that it can be an added value in terms of floodplain lowering where we can get some flood problems downstream. And if you take the example of the Sacramento, uh, you have human stakes in the downstream section of, of the Sacramento uh, Valley. So uh, just to illustrate these purposes, because this is a new research project on which actually we are working on, uh, you, you have the A River, and you see that uh, I explained it's a, a, a quite a shifting river. Uh, you see here uh, that uh, a part of uh, the area is higher, and you have a large part here. You have the relative elevation of the floodplain. You have a large part here, which is quite lower. So the floodplain is at a low level because you have young units. And we are comparing this uh, to the Sacramento River. So this is uh, one of the examples where you can see the movement of the Sacramento, and you can see the, the similitude, the similarity with the Air River. And what you have here, so this is an American river, the Sacramento, and you have a graph here in French. So I have to translate it. <laughs> so uh, this is the uh, relative uh, uh, elevation uh, above the water level, and this is the age of the floodplain. So you can see that uh, the unit, which are between 0 and 10 years, or 10 to 15 years, are statistically lower than the rest of the floodplain. And so this kind of curve should change from one river to another. And this is what we try to explore. What are the corridors with a shifting river, which are interesting in terms of uh, uh, flood retention? OK. So uh, this is why do we promote, and now how do we proceed? And th the question can be uh, uh, approached at different level. I mean, if you, are, uh, if you are a river manager at the base in scale, or in a ministry, or in a water resource department, or whatever, you are managing river at a large scale. You are here. So you, you, you are. You, you, you have money to help local community to develop a policy. But you don't know what you can do where. So you must know where are the rich, where it is interesting to develop a, an erodible corridor. Sometimes you are here at a, a rich, unstable rich. You are, a, you are a, 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 a people. Uh, who want to open a query. So you, you, want to, you want to buy land to open queries in 10 years, in 20 years. You have to planify the, your activity. So you must know if you are in a river with a large floodplain which is stable, so you, you will be safe, you can buy lands, and then you, you are almost sure to open your query within 10 years. Or if you are in such context, if you buy land there, you may not be allowed to open your query. So you, you think at a rich scale. Or you are a, a local elected people or local community, and then you are interested by the sensitivity of the land you have within the erodible corridor. So each time, you have a different scale, and you can approach the problem differently. So when we spoke about the, the corridor of uh, mobility, the space of Liberty, we are at this scale. And we open the box at this scale with the local community. And I will go back to this scale uh, just uh, later. So the guide I spoke about uh, was done for this scale to determine the corridor of Liberty. So uh, sometimes you have no money, and uh, you want to uh, develop actions. So. Uh, you have some easy way to proceed. So some of the uh, proposals are, are to consider what is the uh, uh, amplitude of the meander band. And sometimes we just think about this. We look at the amplitude. And we can say the equilibrium amplitude can be roughly 10 times the bank full width. And then we define a rough corridor like this, or some other 
local community can buy land which are located just uh, on the border of the river and buy land progressively. So this is a, just a, a rough solution without study. You may do that, but it's not very, very efficient. One of the problems is to uh, understood and to predict the movement of the river. It's still complicated, and there is no uh, modeling solution, actually, which can be, there is some modeling solution, but uh, at a cost which is too expensive uh, to, uh, to design such the cost benefit of this kind of study is uh, actually not demonstrated. So most of the time, we use uh, uh, aerial photos, and you, you know that over the last decade, a lot of effort and development has been done with GIS, and also the uh, development of uh, digitizing hair photos, uh, introducing aerial photos within GIS, and then we can do many things uh, uh, within a, a retrospective analysis. And so this is what it is promoted here, is uh, to nest different zones uh, so we can put zone uh, into a, a nested perspective. So we can design the alluvial corridor. I mean, a river can move if uh, it can carry its own uh, alluvial, so alluvial deposits. If you, are, if you reach the valley <coughs> bottom, then you get the geological uh, rock, and then the river cannot move. So this is the first rough uh, band, the alluvial corridor. Within this alluvial corridor, you can design what it is a noun shifting zone. You can see over the last uh, 50 years, one century, where the river moves. And this can give you an idea, if it has not been strongly protected, uh, what is the behavior of the river. In terms of conservation strategy, it can be a, a good way. And sometimes, uh, so you can use these two options to design your corridor, and sometimes you can decide also to introduce some socio-economical constraints. So you can say, uh, this bridge, uh, we cannot uh, accept uh, bank erosion, so you can restrict a bit uh, the functional corridor you have designed from your observation. And so we overlap, we nest uh, the different uh, uh, corridor to provide a sort of zoning uh, you have here. So this is an example which has been done uh, on the Tagliamento River. So it's located in Italy, and some colleague published a paper who said that uh, it is a reference, a river of reference uh, in Europe for the braided river. And you have here the position of the theoretical, uh, of the, sorry, the historical position. And you have here an extrapolation of the, uh, uh, an erosion rate. So it gives you a band where the river uh, can move within the next years. And so uh, when the two are su superimposed, you have a, a, a design of the erodible uh, a corridor. So this is a tool which can be used for uh, managing uh, 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 the, uh, a corridor where you will not uh, promote bank protection. So this is another example of river where you have the movement of the meander. So this gives you an idea of this corridor uh, using the previous position of the channel. And we have also a field reconnaissance where we are looking at the bank protection and the state of the bank protection to see if bands uh, will be stable or will move again in, in, in the future. So I can pass this. So this is a question of designing the corridor, the, 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 this, this corridor where the river can move in the, last, in the next years. You can go further. So you have this idea of the corridor. You can map different zones where you can see that, uh, 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 so here the channel can be stable to slightly unstable, and we move to moderately to highly unstable. You see this area there. And you have within the er erodible corridor different uh, sensitivity from a, a theoretical uh, 
er erosion, so it is possible that it erodes, but because bank protection, uh, because the way the channel is moving in another direction, we, we almost know that in the next 50 years, the channel will not move there. And you have also uh, a long term, so more than 20 years, and potential it, it may move uh, within the, the two decades. So this gives you an idea of the sensitivity of the movement so that the people who are managing this floodplain area can know where they are. And you, you can, you can uh, combine this so the, the hazard, the mapping of the hazard, with the land use, the stakes, uh, the, the price of, of the land. And then you can uh, design a sort of uh, land use policy at the local scale, like, like you will do for the flooding aspects. And what you have here is to combine the hazard, the previous map, with the vulnerability. So here you have a class with a building, roads, spontaneous forest. And this is uh, the uh, active, uh, the, the, the zone where erosion could occur within the next two decades as well here. Here you have poplar plantation in, in the uh, area which should be eroded. And this is a map you can use. The, uh, we, we used it. It has been published in River Research in Application in 1995, I guess, where there, there is a, uh, an economical analysis of uh, the cost benefit of, uh, of the bank protection. So I go further. Uh, this is a rich scale. So if we use uh, uh, GIS, uh, we can cut the, the, the channel in thin segment where we can extract different information. And one of the information is a floodplain area which is eroded between two dates. And from this, you can get a sort of uh, statistics at a, a, a long, uh, rich scale so that you can identify what are the rich where the channel is moving actively, uh, uh, whereas other rich, you know, when you are looking at a map, you see a, 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 a nice uh, a meander bend here. You can imagine that uh, it's uh, uh, an area where the, the river is moving quickly. If you, if you are doing the overlay, you can see that the river is not moving here, but the river is moving more here, okay? So this gives you an idea of the, if you are a, a miner, for example, I, I explained previously, you may open a mining site in the middle of this, uh, uh, of this meander and without any trouble. It's blocked by different outcrops and it will not move. Whereas here, and it is not expected, just looking at the topographical map, you have a shifting riches. Uh, this is a, the, another river. Just to show you here, this is the eroded area. And this is the length of bank which is protected by limestone. And so when we were looking at this map, we, we imagined that this ridge was actively moving because the sinuosity rate is the highest of the, all this ridge. And what we have seen is all these meanders are blocked by limestone, and they don't move. If we had not done the overlay of the different channel position, we would have not seen that. And so this gives you also an idea that a part of this ridge does not move at all, and another part is moving actively. And this is also a, a, an example where I can introduce another idea. Uh, uh, from this talk, you, you must not imagine that uh, uh, unprotection is the best policy. Unprotection of bank is a good policy in a given geographical context. But uh, you can protect banks with uh, mineral or riprap protection or uh, bioengineering techniques in other uh, uh, reaches. And we know, I have not time to develop this, but some other rivers can move, and the movement of the rivers can be a problem for aquatic ecosystems. But it depends where you are. And here I just spoke about the gravel bed rivers in a alpine and Piedmont environment, where uh, here we have uh, effectively a strong link between erosion and uh, uh, biological richness. OK, so uh, I will finish with the network scale. Here is the main issue. Where are located the river who are moving actively? 
And so now we have a GIS tool. We begin to play at a rich scale, uh, 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 correcting aerial photos, overlaying the different photos. And now we have more and more digital information. We can play with data at a much larger scale to develop this. So uh, this is uh, uh, the district I refer. In red, this is uh, the, the river where we should define a streamway, a, a corridor of mobility. As be, it has been done just by uh, experience, expert knowledge from engineers of the water resource. And they said, this reach should be unstable, this one, this one. And it was the, 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 pre, the pioneer document to develop a policy of the, uh, of the mobility, of the corridor of mobility. And so now we have the document, and uh, we have also the computer capacity. We must go back to this and try to explain, to, to locate where are these corridors. And this is where actually we are working on, and uh, uh, Adrien Albert, my co-author, is uh, working on this part in order to provide uh, some document for practitioners which will be implemented uh, into the French policy. So uh, we use different kind of documents, so we can get some uh, digitized stream networks, we can get DM, digital elevation model, we can get also uh, different kind of aerial photographies. So I have not time to explain all this. Uh, the time is passing quickly, but uh, you can see at, uh, uh, if we have digitized uh, stream network, then we can detect uh, the in inflection point and we can get the amplitude or the wavelengths of the meander and develop a statistics at the network scale. So you have here a mapping of the amplitudes of, uh, of the different uh, uh, sinuosity of, uh, of the river. Another possibility using the DM, using also the stream network, is to locate what are, uh, where are located the alluvial corridor. And you know that uh, the river is moving if it is located in its alluvial corridor and if it is not touching the border of the valley. So if you want to see where is the, the, the network where the channel can move, you have to remove the, 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 the network length where the valley is constraining the movement of the channel. And so this can be done with GIS. So just to give you an idea, we are here on the draw, and you can get some static sticks. You can see uh, uh, the valley uh, corridor, and here you have the valley width, uh, and then we can also uh, identify the, uh, the channel. We can draw the channel position at different dates, and then we can get an ID of uh, the erosion in different parts of uh, the, ne the network. When we arrived at this stage, uh, we have a limitation. I mean, you have so many aerial photos, you have to digitize and scan that you cannot do at a network scale of 45,000 kilometers square. So uh, we need to sample. And so we get 50 reaches where we looked at the photos. And then we must find a way to predict bank erosion using some easy uh, to uh, extract parameter from GIS to try to predict where are the potentially unstable reaches. So just to give you an idea about the corridors here, I have not time to develop all the stuff, but you'll, you'll see that uh, we have the alluvial reach of uh, all the uh, area here, so over 45,000 kilometers. We know what is the width of the valley. And we have not yet explored this, but uh, in terms of fundamental research, it's already uh, an exciting point because uh, how, the valley how the valley widths are created what are the differences between different uh, 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 regional environment? It's a critical issue in terms of paleohydrology, and it has not been done yet. Another, uh, so here you have an idea of uh, uh, we have all the valley widths, and you have here the classes of uh, uh, the river network. If it's confined, blocked by valley width, 
straight, sinuous, very sinuous, or meandering. So it's a, a, a first map where you can see potentially where the river can move. Okay, so my black point, black circle, are, are our sample reaches. In, uh, in red, this is a confined uh, reach, and in uh, gray, it's my unconfined, where potentially a river can move. And this is uh, erosion rate per year on the different sampling points. So you see that we have a nice spot here where the river is moving, shifting actively, whereas in my lowland area, you can see that uh, the shifting is not as active as it, it is in this part. You have also an idea of the sinuosity. You see my lowland meandering river here with a high sinuosity, and my wandering and, and braided and free meandering rivers locate, lo located here. And here, this is the active channel width. So I, do, I don't show you all the maps, but you can imagine that behind the maps you have here, you have a huge database which can be explored in different ways. So you have nice maps also, if you are a geographer or if you like map, it's a, it's a nice process to create a lot of them. And so here you have the channel slope I showed you before. And this is a total stream power you can see, so you see the lowland with a low stream power and the high stream power you can get there, uh, here. And so this is one of the most uh, exciting uh, graph uh, you, you have created over uh, the last five years. Is here, it is an idea of the uh, erosion. So large circle is high erosion and a square is no erosion. And you, you, see, you see the gradient. I mean, you have a lot of erosion here, lower here, and no erosion there. And if you look at that, you have to consider the active channel width, which is rated by the, by the uh, Q2 discharge. And you have here the total stream power. And so it is possible to predict uh, erosion. So here you have, a, you have the, uh, it's a, a multiple uh, regression model where we have uh, integrated so erosion rate and here you have the uh, the width of the active channel rated by the catchment size and here you have the growth stream power and you have the predicted erosion and you have observed erosion and all this is different kind of rivers so some of the rivers respond very nicely to the model and some others in this area respond much less so this is a result which has been extracted uh, last week. So we are just at the beginning of exploring these aspects, but just to show you that it, it works. And then now we, we are able to map uh, and to locate the area which are uh, actively uh, 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 moving. So the conclusions. Erosion is a process which is not always bad. So erosion can be good. Uh, bank protection does not solve all the problems and may generate some other ones. So uh, we have to think before acting, and uh, we hope so that uh, we can. And uh, protection and non-protection non are both valuable and complementary options within an integrated basin management program, and I introduced this idea uh, previously. Uh, we need a participative approach to find the best solution. I mean, actually, scientists work together with practitioners uh, hand by hand, and uh, they involve uh, other, actually, other kind of scientists in an interdisciplinary way, but also uh, people living in this area. We, we cannot uh, promote new ideas and new options change our way of managing rivers and basins if we have no interaction with people. And uh, the last time is we need to anticipate and plan actions. I mean, uh, you have here about restoration, you have here about conservation, but uh, you cannot restore or conserve if you don't integrate such policy with the other policy, because you can decide to restore here because you have reasons, 
And in the same time, in your basin plan, you can decide to conserve here because you have the best, the most valuable ecosystem. And in other time, you can decide to develop and protect your infrastructures and your activity in other parts of the basin. And all this can be think in the same, uh, in, in parallel, so that you can decide in a, in a good way how to manage. And planning is becoming one of the critical issues uh, we are faced to. Thank you. Thanks, Hervé. If I could add uh, a little bit of commentary. Um, when we talk about stream restoration in the US, it's uh, mostly been going in with bulldozers or, um, or excavators and creating channels, often in the image of some ideal form, um, instead of looking at the process. And it's quite interesting to um, see the in Europe, uh, the Water Framework Directive was adopted by the European Union in, in 2000, and it's uh, motivating a lot of work. And a lot of what you see going on in Europe is process-based restoration, looking at the river processes, trying to liberate the rivers from their chains and, uh, and restore the processes that then create the habitats. I think uh, everybody's talk uh, provided some very good examples of that. Um, and uh, in fact, it was um, some of the, the uh, French innovations which were adopted by the Water Framework Directive and uh, which are still sort of uh, leading examples in Europe and I think should perhaps be examples for us to look at as we uh, consider how to proceed. And the Sacramento River system where Hervé and I are, are working, uh, we have um, a, a process that began around 1980 uh, with uh, the Department of Fish and Game and other agencies, uh, Nature Conservancy, to, to uh, set aside lands along the river. Diana Jacobs can tell us more about this. Um, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's probably one of the best examples we have. Um, of the 100 miles from Red Bluff down to Calusa along the Sacramento River, which is the part that is still active and which everybody was talking about, um, about 50% of the of the area within the erodible zone has been put into some kind of conservation easement or is actually owned by uh, Fish and Wildlife Service or Fish and Game or Nature Conservancy. And, um, uh, and that, you know, that process is continuing. So it's actually a, a, a very unusual success story in preserving what works, which should really be our, our top priority, as, as everybody was saying. Um, okay, we'll open it up to questions. I'll turn it over to Linda to moderate those. Okay, thank you. And um, can, um, for those who would like to ask questions, can you please um, wait for the mic? Thanks. Thanks. I'm, um, I'm interested you know, to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on uh, the uh, kind of uh, different approaches to uh, not so much the um, a preservation question, but the res restoration uh, sites. And when you're looking at, at restoration and you've got existing developments and facilities that have concentrated on riverbanks, um, what are the advantages of using kind of a, a cor stream corridor approach to other um, approaches? Um, you suggested on one of your slides that um, uh, re-sedimentation would be kind of an alternative approach to protecting banks and um, limiting downstream incision. Um, it would seem to me that the uh, concept of corridors would provide, um, you know, even though that in the preservation set scenario, that's obviously a, a great way to go. In a restoration scenario, it might provide kind of a, a lightning rod or place for opposition to kind of galvanize around, um, specifically around property rights. And so how, from the political perspective, how do you 
um, see kind of integrating the corridor approach uh, working out. Okay. Uh, can I speak? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the space of mobility uh, actually is uh, really adapted for a, a conservation perspective. And uh, you have, uh, and also to try to uh, limit uh, the question of uh, uh, stabilization of the most valuable uh, shifting rivers. So it means that uh, we have, uh, uh, it, it is a, a way in terms of policy to stop the process of the multiplication of bank protection on such, uh, within such riches. And uh, so conservation and potential improvement, uh, mitigation. Uh, wh when you reached uh, a, a reach which is uh, strongly modified, uh, it becomes very difficult to promote such actions. And uh, you have uh, other uh, restoration policy you can promote. This, this is what, what I would, would mean. Uh, sometimes, it depends where you are. But uh, you have some rich where, uh, like in the S Switzerland, where you have uh, many options where the dikes were built on the, on the bank to push the dikes farther away. So here there is a question of uh, movement, a new movement of the channel within uh, this new embanked corridor. So uh, this is uh, areas where we can think about uh, where it's strongly modified, where we can think about the corridor, erodible corridor. But uh, it's, it's, a new, it's a new thinking and process. I mean, we go this way in the, in the, in the coming decade. This is what I would say. If we take the example of the uh, river, uh, upstream, the area is affected by sediment starvation due to the dam. <coughs> it is incised, and the channel does not move anymore. The bank are too high and stabilized. Here we can promote a restoration perspective, and the sediment reintroduction can help the river uh, to move the flow on one bank with the gravel uh, being transported. And this is one of the process of uh, redistributing uh, uh, the, shear, the shear stress uh, within the cross section and reactivating the bank erosion process. So here we have really a, a, a restoration strategy. And downstream, where we have, uh, uh, where the river is not yet affected by the dam, the sediment recharge in the restored reach should continue to provide sediment so that this reach can continue to move. And here we are in a conservation perspective. So this is the same program. But we have one reach where we have a restoration strategies and a downstream reach where we have a conservation strategies. I don't uh, develop the other measures which, are, which has been done. Have you had, a, have you had the opportunity to see where uh, river management and flood management uh, are working together with these concepts? Uh, what, what do you mean? What, what I have developed about uh, flood, uh, flood lowering or? Right, especially in terms of uh, land use management in, uh, in rural and urban areas. Um, actually, uh, 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 there is a new concept which is emerging, is uh, uh, the functional corridor. So it means that uh, it's a new nested approach where we are going to combine uh, the erodible corridor, I would say the, the flooding zone, but also uh, uh, the, the natural corridor, which is interesting for birds or w which is interesting for water quality improvement and other things. So this is a new concept which is emerging. And now we, we are asked uh, by the water agency who is managing the, the district you see here to develop a guideline about how to design such zone. So uh, I think it's a, a new emerging uh, concept, integrating the different stacks. If, uh, if I could add something here, the, uh, the River Rhine from uh, Basel downstream to uh, Mannheim would be a, a, 
a good example of this because this is a reach that in the 20th century was, was levied very closely and uh, some engineer woke up at three o'clock in the morning and realized that, uh, that they were screwed because if, if they had a repeat of the 1883 rainfall, they would be directing with those levees, they would be directing this flood down to the BASF plant at Ludwigshafen, which is about 20 hectares of chemicals all over the place, and they would have had this huge disaster, you know, this contamination downstream. So they've been working very, very rapidly over the last 20 years to um, reopen the floodplain. So they are, um, they are um, identifying polders that can be flooded. And so, uh, and that's the most efficient way to manage that big flood. So if it was just up to the engineers, they would keep the gates closed until they had a 100-year flood on their hands, and then they would open them and, and let the water out. But because um, times have changed, they have to do ecological flooding. So now these polders are inundated every two years or so, uh, and everybody's been working on some of um, some of. But anyways, it's, very, it's involving ecology as well as the flood control. The flood control was the urgent thing that that has, is dr uh, driving this process of reflooding the floodplain, but uh, the ecology is riding on its back, and and we're restoring all kinds of floodplain that were. Uh, dried out and, and essentially uh, moribund for a long time. I, um, yeah, Hervé, I was just wondering, um, so you've talked mostly about uh, sort of the land use and bank protection side of things. Um, and I was just wondering, is there, because, you know, obviously if you're talking about coarse sediment transport, you're also there has to be some component of flow, um, and particularly where you're dealing in places that have large dams, uh, where the channels that are existing might be actually remnant, they're sort of remnant channels that are uh, probably not functioning the same way as they did before the dams. I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about, uh, you know, if there's any components of flow as part of these um, espacio de liberté. <laughs> um. Here, here you, you speak about uh, uh, a restoration, and uh, uh, you, you base your uh, approach on a, uh, historical reference. In Europe, uh, you have no historical reference. So uh, we, we, because uh, uh, since the Neolithic period, uh, the land is uh, actively uh, modified. And when we go back, looking at our nice braided river, they are associated with a mountain where, uh, w w which was densely humanized. So the braided river you know here, you see now, which are interesting in terms of ecological purposes, are partly a construction of, human, of past human activity. So just to say that uh, usually we use a term, not restoration, but rehabilitation. And uh, one of the thing is uh, the question of uh, improving the ecological uh, aspect of a river. And we can take a bit, uh, we, we can take into account the history to know what it is possible and also to, to have some ethic consideration. Otherwise, you can do uh, everything you want. I mean, uh, you can create a canal or a corridor just for salmon. You know what I mean? So, so. Uh, it means that uh, in this kind of uh, context, uh, different options are possible to improve the ecological aspects, and the bank erosion uh, preservation or restoration can, can be uh, one thing. Uh, now, when we design this, uh, we, we, have, uh, uh, to, we must provide a, a diagnosis to know how it works and uh, what is the trajectory of the river, how it evolves, over the last decades or five or six decades. And for sure, we consider uh, the bed load transport and it changed through time, but also we look at uh, the hydrology and the flow conditions. Uh, because uh, you have different context. Uh, you, you, you can get uh, uh, less peak flows and sometimes no peak flows. Um, on, on the Ain River, one of the ideas was, for example, to, uh, uh, to modify the peak flow management because we have a peak flow lowering due to the dam. The big floods do, did not occur. 
And in such context, they, they wanted to recreate floods. And uh, we said it, it's not really a good idea because if you develop more floods, then your gravel we, will move down uh, quickly. And uh, so the degradation of the, of the river will go faster. So uh, this is a way, just an example, to show you how the flow is introduced into the sinking and what we can do on that. In another, on the Rhone River, you have a dam. You have no more gravel. It's stabilized by different uh, infrastructure. Here, we, we, it has been developed uh, a policy of flow restoration where we increase the minimum flow. But we are in two geomorphic uh, and social uh, reaches where these the two options are different. Is it uh, clear? Um, I want to ask you about uh, the sample locations and the sizes when you were uh, mapping all of the different areas. So about how big were those sample areas and what were your considerations for choosing the different sample areas? Uh, we, we, uh, we choose uh, some uh, reaches which are stable and uh, others which are unstable. And uh, we sample in uh, different uh, uh, eco-regional context so that we can get uh, 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 all, we can uh, integrate all the special variability we have at a network scale. So it is uh, 100 uh, reaches and uh, for which we uh, digitized uh, two years, uh, roughly the 70s and uh, 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 early uh, 2000s. Different size, different, different size. size, yes, different size, and uh, stable, unstable. 